We're here at the State of Silicon Valley Conference with Tom Gage, the CEO of AC Propulsion, which is a company based in Los Angeles that makes electric car drive systems. And uh, Tom, I guess the basic question that a lot of folks have is, looking out, uh, say, 10 years from now, uh, and even 25 years from now, what are the automobiles that we are going to be driving in the United States? What are they going to look like? Well, I think in the United States, the big issue is fuel consumption, gasoline consumption specifically. And we have to reduce that in every way possible, which means we probably have to drive less to some degree, but our cars have to be a lot more efficient, so they have to become smaller, they have to start having hybrid drive systems. And even that's not enough. If everybody drove a hybrid today, people in the United States would still use twice as much gasoline each as their people, as their counterparts in Europe and Japan. So we have to do more than conserve, we have to substitute. And that means finding other fuels, such as electricity, to start powering our cars. So 10 years from now, are we all going to be driving plug-in hybrids or hydrogen vehicles, or what, what do you see? Well, the, uh, the automotive industry, the fleet, turns over pretty slowly. We've had hybrids out on the market now for 10 years, and in, in this area, they're a fairly high uh, uh, penetration, let's say something like 10% maybe in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. But nationwide, they're only about 1% or 2%. So in 10 years, you get 1% or 2% adoption of a new technology like that. And uh, the, the pace may accelerate, but still it takes a long, long time to displace all these cars and bring in new technology. And I guess uh, increasing gasoline prices speed that turnover. That would be the best thing we could do. Yeah. And by the way, I used to work in Detroit, and I, I used to work with some of the top executives there, and privately they will say they would love a gas tax, because that that's what will drive demand for small cars. Passing cafe laws and other laws that don't affect demand are not an effective way to get smaller cars on the road. Now, um, electric cars always come up in these kind of discussions, and uh, we've had uh, a movie called Who Killed the Electric Car? There's a, you just don't see them around uh, in comparison to the promise that we were told maybe 10 years ago. I guess the question for you is what happened to electric cars? Who killed the electric car? Well, if I had to blame one party, I'd say it was the California Air Resources Board. Mm -hmm. um, they brought in a very uh, tough regulation that required all the car companies to start building electric cars. But they did that after General Motors had already announced it was going to build electric cars. So if they had left things alone, GM would have had the mark to itself. It would have had a rationale for being first to the market with an electric car, and I think they would have succeeded there. But once the regulation regulations came in, all the car companies had to compete for a market that really didn't exist yet. So it made no sense for any one car company, and they fought the regulation. What would you say to skeptics who say, you know, electric cars are great for short trips, but they just don't have the range, and that's why I don't want my family to break down by the side of the road, and so, I mean, you hear that a lot, I'm sure. You do. And it's a valid concern, but most trips are short trips. In fact, an overwhelming percentage, um, the average mileage for a person is is 40 miles a day on average. So that's well within the range of an EV. The number of times they need more than that, or the, the, the big question is how many times per year will somebody be inconvenienced if their car only has, say, 100 miles of range? And I've been looking for statistics on that. I haven't really found them, but it, you know, it's, it's a number maybe 10, 20, something like that times per year mm -hmm. when you need a different car. Now, a lot of people have alternatives. They have a second car in their garage, or they can rent a car or borrow a car. But uh, more and more, the people will understand that they don't need all that extra range. They don't need to carry around 300 miles of range because they almost never use it. Now, there are a number of new uh, auto companies starting up around the country, and particularly here in Silicon Valley, where some people have wondered whether Silicon Valley, California, might be the next Detroit of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your thinking on these new electric car companies? Are they, are they just for elite drivers who can spend $100,000, or do you really see them catching on in the next, say, 10 or 20 years? Very interesting question. Uh, Tesla is probably the most well-known, and we actually have licensed technology to Tesla. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we certainly strongly hope they succeed, um, but it's natural for, for new products like an electric car to be introduced around the fringes of a market, and the, the Tesla is a, is a fringe product, a very desirable product, but not that many people buy exotic sports cars to begin with, and then an electric one. And $100,000 each. And $100,000. Yeah. But uh, they set a halo, they create demand, they create awareness, and that's a very important aspect of bringing the public more into, uh, into the electric car market. So is that market ever going to expand into regular middle class folks? Oh, I think it will. The car we sell, the e-box, it's, it's basically a low volume conversion of a Toyota Scion. But it's very well suited for, uh, for around town use for families. It seats five very easily. It's a very comfortable car, very utilitarian, very useful, fun to drive, sporty. I mean, 
I love the e-box and, and the people who have sold them to love them too. Now this is Silicon Valley and I guess I'll end with this question. Uh, we have a lot of engineers here, a lot of people who like to tinker with everything that they have in their, in their house, including their cars. And uh, certainly people are working on plug-in hybrid vehicles. And, mm -hmm. and one of the offshoots of that is, is vehicle-to-grid technology. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, vehicle-to-grid is the idea that if you have a lot of cars with batteries on them, uh, most cars, electric cars or hybrid cars included, are parked 20 to 23 hours a day and they can be plugged into the grid. So what you've got here is a car with a battery that's sitting idle and it's connected to the grid. Now every guy who works for a utility says if only we could have a big battery on the grid that would be great, it would solve a lot of problems. So the car represents that and the utility doesn't have to pay for the battery because the car owner already bought the battery. Mm -hmm. But the utility can make use of it. And it's, of course it's a lot more complicated in its implementation but the fundamental idea is cars can represent a battery on the grid. Or the idea being sort of if you have a blackout, you can run the lights in your house from Absolutely. your automobile yeah. potentially or put that juice back up on the wires right. for the rest of the community. Looking at it on a, on a one house basis, that's the idea, but typically we don't have blackouts, but it's still very useful even in the normal operation of the grid. Great. Tom, thanks so much. Thank you for having me.